When I wrote The Way of the Warrior, I was grappling with one universal question. Can humanity ever come to know peace? The world rages in war because there's a war that rages within us. How do we come to world peace? Can only be answered in one way. The world will never know peace until we know peace. The way of the warrior is a battle for peace. And the struggle is completely within us. Good morning. What's up, guys? All right. Everybody's excited. It's good. Good summer? It's been a good summer? All right, maybe. Okay. You guys look tanner. Maybe it's just the lights. I'm not quite sure. It is good to be with you guys, though. Hey, also, it was amazing to be with Metro last week. I got to just give it up to Metro. What's up, guys? They're joining us. Hello. 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 We love you guys up there as well. It's going to be a good, good morning. We are concluding our summer series called The Way of the Warrior. And so like last week, uh, you guys watched a video from Earl McManus, and I went to Metro Live. It's a, just a great community there. And by the way, it's in Plaza Midwood, and so if you have friends, neighbors, you know, ex-girlfriends, I'm not quite sure, invite them or send them there. You know what I'm saying? But it's a great community to be, be, be a part of. And I was there, and so but I was there live and spoke there. So if you go on our website. You can watch my, uh, actually you can't watch it. You can listen to my talk uh, from last week over there. But if you want to watch Erwin's talk, which is so much better, I got to tell you, uh, you can just Google him. He's pretty popular and uh, you can watch that talk. But this morning we are concluding our series and talking about this idea, uh, how do we stand in our pain, stand in our pain. So what does that even look like, right? Uh, so I need some crowd participation. I think you guys are excited. I think so. I think so, right? Right? Yes. Okay. So I want to raise of hands uh, if you, if you, if you, uh, if this pertains to you. Okay. Um, how many of you have, you've never broken a bone in your body? Anybody? You've never, really? You've never broken a bone in your body. Wow. Okay. Metro. Okay. 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 How many of you have broken two bones in your body? Three bones in your body. Four bones in your body. The same three people's hands are up. Five bones in your, five bones in your body. Seven bones in your body. Sir, do you know what seven means? Seven bones. Ten bones in your body. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. Somebody give him a coffee or so, something. Or something. Wow. Wow. It's a record, I think. Maybe it should be a record. Glad you're here, bro. Glad you're here. And you serve. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Glad you're alive. Okay, okay. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. So I've broken a bone. It was actually called a, a boxer's break. Uh, what that means is you, you, it's, a, it's when you break your hand. And uh, the story really is uh, pretty profound because uh, there, was, uh, there was a crowd, uh, I remember w once just walking by, and there was this, like, this one kid who was being bullied by these guys. And I went in, and I, 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 I went into, into the fight, you know? And uh, I mean, you know, I, I got a little heart, but I, I, I broke my hand protect, protecting him. That's not true. That's not true at all. That's not true at all. That's my wife. If you, I don't know if you heard her. She's like, that's not true. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but uh, I actually was goofing around in the pool uh, one summer uh, with my kids and their friends. And uh, Bri uh, no, Cavazos, who's a part of our youth, she, I was picking her up and tossing her in the pool. And she slipped and she took, she took my pinky with her. Yeah, it, is, was, it, was, it was bad. And, but when I went to the doctor, they said, uh, so it's called a boxer's break, which sounds cool, <laughs> right? It's like, yes, um, but it, it sounds really cool. It's really, and then for a while, I, I kept on telling people, oh, yeah, I got a boxer's break. I broke my hand. I broke my hand. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. But don't tell me about how it happened, but I broke my hand. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's cool. And it's funny about scars and wounds and things that we break. Like, sometimes when you get on the other side of it, we are actually excited about it. We, like, we don't want to hide them. We want to uh, uncover them. You know, it's like about scars. Like, oh, yeah, look at this or look at that. Or, because there's, it says something about our resilience, doesn't it? So physically, we're all about that. We're all about letting people know. But when it comes to the emotional and psychological scars, when it comes to things like that, when you get wounds or when you break something, uh, emotionally, that's what we want to not cover. We want to cover it up, right? We want to we make sure 
Uh, we don't uh, tell people uh, about it because sometimes it can hurt us even more. And so this idea of standing in our pain is a conversation about what does that look like when life leaves you scarred and wounded, when it leaves you in a point where you're like, I'm not quite sure if I believe this whole God stuff anymore, or I'm not even sure if I believe in people. Like, what do you do when life just um, bombards you and leaves you kind of raw in life? What does that mean? And so when, um, when Irwin's book talks about it, and he ends with the book about uh, standing in the pain, I, I, I stop and go, okay, that's really hard to do. I know that it, this book and this series is about, like, really, truly being a person that wins the battle within. Like, you're a strong person. You're a warrior within. And so standing in our pain, standing in the midst of what we've gone through or going through is an important part of really being a true warrior from the inside out. And let me read you a passage of Scripture. If you've got your Bibles, you can uh, jump to that. We'll put it on the screens for you as well. Uh, it's Proverbs 18. It says this, and this is so true about the human condition. It says, the human spirit can endure a sick body. A human spirit can endure a sick body, but who can bear, who can bear a what? A crushed spirit. I mean, uh, have, you, have you found yourself there? Are you standing in some pain right now? Uh, maybe it's the pain of loss or betrayal. Uh, maybe it's the pain of, I don't know, anxiety, a burden, uh, um, a disappointment or failure. Uh, is, it, is, there, is there a regret that you can't just shake off? Regret is hard, isn't it? It's like, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. I think sometimes regret is the worst thing in the world because you can't, you can't, get, it, you can't get it back, you know? Um, what about this? What about when you stand in the pain of God not answering a prayer? You know, you're like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great, uh, but I, just, I don't know what God's doing. I don't know what God's up to. What, what, do you, what do you do? What do you do? And so what I hear is what I want to do. I want to take us to a passage of Scripture that I think is very profound. I have talked about it before, but it's a story about John the Baptist, okay? Now, if you know anything about John the Baptist, he's the guy who baptized, anybody know who? Jesus. He's also the founder of the Baptist Church. No, he's not. No, he's not. Some of you guys writing notes. Not true, not true. It's a lie. That's not true. Okay, the, those guys just made it up of themselves. Okay, anyway, so... Uh, so John the Baptist is the guy who's a cousin of Jesus, and if you know anything about him, he, he, he was part of the family. He, he saw Jesus grow up, and uh, so he was the guy who, when he came to age, he had a calling in his life. I mean, he was born with a calling. Jesus had a calling to be the Messiah, and, but in the family, it was kind of like John is the guy who's going to be a, a prophet. He's going to be someone special that's connected to Jesus, and he was. He was a guy who, as an adult, moved towards the wilderness. He became this, the first hippie, I think, maybe. Uh, he, uh, he became a prophet who was in the wilderness. He'd wear different clothes. I mean, he was just not a guy who lived in, lived in suburbia. No, not at all. He was this guy who was proclaiming this idea of a Messiah that was going to come and that he believed that he was to prepare the way for people. And so John started doing certain things that Jesus would do, and he started baptizing people before Jesus showed up. And so if you know the story, he's baptizing people, and then Jesus actually what? Shows up, and John baptizes him. So if there's any guy who knew that Jesus was the Messiah, it would be who? John. They were cousins. In fact, after he baptized him, he said, hey, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, he's the guy who verbally said, hey, out loud, let me just tell you, I don't know what you guys believe, but I'm just telling you, this is the guy, the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah who takes away the sins of the world. So now we know if there's anyone who knows that Jesus is the Messiah, it is John the Baptist. It is John the Baptist for sure. He spent his whole life preparing the way for him. But in this passage, you find that John is in prison. John is, is stuck in prison, and he realizes that Jesus is out doing his ministry. Like, basically, Jesus has started doing stuff. First, he was not doing anything. He basically comes out, in a sense, like he says, okay, I'm, I'm going to start doing some miracles. And he begins doing what we call ministry. He starts healing people, uh, providing free health care, I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? He starts doing that. John is nowhere to be found, which is really interesting. John spent his whole life preparing a way for a guy. He was his bro, hey, ride or die, right? And then after the baptism, they don't meet. 
John doesn't go and say, I'm going to be your first disciple. Let's do this together. No, John goes his separate way. Jesus goes his separate way, which is really interesting. And then John finds himself in prison. And, he's, and there we find this story. So let's pick it up. It's in Matthew chapter 11. It says, when Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he went out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard all the things that the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, to ask Jesus, hey, how's it going, bro? How's it going? Man, miss you the other day, miss you at dinner. I don't, I don't know. What was he going to ask? They were family. Here's what he asked them. Verse 3, are you ready for this? He says, here's what I want you to ask him. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we, be keep, should we keep looking for someone else? Now, I don't know if it's passive aggressive. I don't know what it is. But it's like, hey, ask him this question. Hey, is he the one? Is he the one? Now, could you imagine if you're the guy who's going to tell this, to convey the message to Jesus? He's like, oh, uh, John, you're asking me, the guy you told me he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? That dude, you're asking me to tell, ask him if he's actually the one that you baptized? John, what's going on? Just ask him. Just ask him. Go ask him. Is he the one? So he goes back and says, hey, gee, you know, remember John? Yeah, John, the guy who baptized you, who said the Lamb of God who takes up the sin in the world? Yeah, that guy. He's asking if you're really the one. Or should he keep looking for someone else? What's going on there? Right? And so what happens next? What happens next is Jesus tells, he tells him, hey, go back. Go back and tell John and tell him what you have seen, what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, and those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, and the dead, and the dead, what are they doing? They are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And then he says, and he added, God blesses those who do not fall away, help me out with that, who do not fall away, Metro as well, who do not fall away, what? Because of me. Wow. Hey, t- go tell John what you see and hear. All these things that he said are happening. I'm not gonna answer his question, I'm just telling you, tell him what you see. And by the way, also tell him, please don't fall away because of what I'm gonna do and what I'm not going to do. And God blesses those who are not offended by me in some translations. Basically, he's saying, John, John, tell, tell this to John. Tell John that I love people. I'm doing what God's told me to do. I'm doing exactly what you said I will do, and I love you, and I love the world, and I've come for the world, but John, you're going to die in prison. I'm not coming for you. You don't need to look for another, but I'm not coming. I love you, but you're going to die. Like, that's the message. Hey, I love you. I love you. I love you, but you're going to go through this crap. You're going to, this is not going to end well in this life for you. Hey, I know I can actually say the word, snap my fingers, and the jail cells will open. I love you, bro, but I'm not coming for you. I'm not coming. Who wants to hear that? Right? I'm sure the disciples going back, and then John's like, ask him again. I can wait. Ask him again. And so when, and then it goes on, the story goes and says, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking to him about the crowd. This is the first time Jesus actually is bragging on talking about someone who's not in the room. He's like, let me just tell you about John. Can I tell you about John really quick, guys? He says, hey, what kind of a man did you, did you go into the wilderness to see? Let me just ask you, who, what kind of person did you think John was? Was he a weak, weak a reed swaying with every breath of the wind? Do you expect a weak man to go out and do what he's doing? Or did, were you expected to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, person with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, he is, guess what, more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, look, I'm sending a messenger ahead of you and he's prepared your way before you. I tell you the truth and all I have, that have ever lived, none is greater than who? John the Baptist. 
And then he keeps on going, and yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the time of John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and violent people are what? Are attacking it. And he's saying, let me just tell you something. Let me just tell you, he might be questioning in this moment of of pain in his life as he's standing in waiting with all the anxiety of losing his life and the anxiety of what's going to happen to his family. I mean, all of those things he's going through. He's standing in his pain and he's doubting who I am. But let me just tell you, let me just confirm who he is. He is the guy. He's been the guy. He's always been the guy. So let me just tell you right now, you might doubt God, but he doesn't doubt you. He still believes in you, he's still for you, he still believes that you are more than your pain, more than all the doubts, the sum of doubts that you carry and that you brought in even to this place and at Metro. He believes it. He's like, I, I know you don't, you don't even know who I am right now because, because, I mean, loss does this, right? Grief does this. Does it not like spin you around sometimes? You're like, I don't even know what's going on. Like what is happening right now? You don't even know. Because when emotions take over, when pain takes over, it kind of just does something to you. In the midst of that, God's saying, hey, 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 let me just tell you, let me just tell you. You're still the guy. You're still that person. You still had a real relationship with me. You still knew me in your teens. You still had a, that moment you had, it's still there. I know that you spent your, a season of your life like in the middle of this pain and anxiety and loss and betrayal and despair. I get it. But man, I'll tell you what, you are, let me just tell you, John the Baptist was the greatest, but guess what? Uh, and like, but, but here's where I just want to spin that. The least person in the kingdom is actually greater than him, which means this, I love you equally. I love you fully. I need you to understand this. So let me give you a couple of things here from this story. If you're taking notes, those of you who want to take notes. Number one, God allows pain in our lives. He just allows pain in our lives. And when pain hits us and when things hit, hit us, here's what we start thinking. We're like, no, 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 there's something wrong with me. Like, I'm not significant. I'm not, I'm not worthy to be loved. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not normal. I'm not enough. I'm not, I'm not successful, I guess. I'm not... I'm not wanted by God. Maybe I'm not even thought of by God. Uh, I, I, you just start thinking about all the knots. Like, I'm not safe. I'm not, I'm not any of these things. But I need you to understand, if you're a follower of Jesus, and even if you're not, God allows things in your life. In fact, we're going to do a whole series about this in the next couple of months. But I want you to know that. Number two, God's expectations are very different from people's. God's expectations are very different. People have an opinion about why you are going through what you're going through. Has anyone here heard that before? Raise your hand. Everybody has an opinion and everybody has a plan for your life. Everybody knows why, what you need, should need to do. Sometimes it's all about, like sometimes when guys hang out, what, what it is sometimes is basically we're either just talking superficial stuff or we're telling each other what to do. You know what you should do. You know what you should try. You know what you should watch. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But God's expectation and people's expectation are very, very different. So it doesn't matter why you're going through this because people have a view of why you got a divorce and why you went through this crisis and why your marriage is the way it is and why you are waiting. People have all kinds of opinion about that. And it's not God's. It's just people's. It's just people's. You need to understand that. God's expectation, because people expect something else. And Jesus is saying, what did you expect? Let me tell you. Mine's expect, my expectations are very different. Number three is this idea of like he, un, he uniquely loved us and, and we're equally important to him. And that's why he tells, hey, John is the greatest, but the least person is greater than John. He loves you. Just because you're going through this crisis, just because you're on, you got the stop sign and everybody else got the go sign doesn't mean that you're not going to go forward. It just means... You're, you, it's just, your life is different. You just got to understand that. You, your life is very, very different. And number four, if I can give you a number four, it, it would be um, life with God is death with self. And I know it's tough to understand, like, get that, but I, I love the phrase, living my best life. You know, there are all kinds of songs, it's just fun, and I make fun of that, living my best life. 
live my best life. But, I mean, when you think about it, if you want to live a significant life, if you want to live a life that truly is real and not superficial, it's not about living your best life. It's becoming your best self. And becoming your best self is, is when you and I connect ourselves to the creator, connect ourselves to something bigger. And so life with God is truly a death with self, a self motivation and self-ambition and selfishness. I mean, there's a death to all of those things. And so you and I have to understand that there's going to be a point in your life that God's going to say, I love you. I love you. I've never not loved you. I still care about you. I am for you. I'm telling you I'm for you. I, I still believe in you. All of those things are true, so true, but you're going to be in prison and you're going to go through this season and this marriage is going to end. I love you, but I, I, I love you, but there's something more going on, and I just need you to understand that. And I need you to stop thinking that because things happen to me, because you're in pain, I don't love you. And your religion or your faith is, is not good enough. I was recently sitting uh, with a guy, a pastor friend of mine, and, and I've known him for, 20, I think, over 25 years. And early on in my faith, he was this guy who really mentored me a little bit. And uh, I, I don't know if you know my story, but basically I got introduced to Jesus first and then the church, right? And so I started looking at uh, different denominations and just checking out uh, churches. And, and I, I realized that every church is different, obviously, and they believe different things. And so I went to his church and he, the, he would, it, would be, it, would, it would be called like a Pentecostal Pentecostal church? Anybody know what Pentecostal is? Anybody, anybody from a Pentecostal church? Any? No one wants to admit that. Okay, okay. All right. All right. Okay. You sorry. Yes. Okay. Charismatic. Any charismatics? Okay, whatever, man. Any Baptists? No, no one's acknowledging anything. We are nothing. We are nothing. Okay, I, I love that. But so I went to this charismatic Pentecostal church, and uh, they really believed that your, your faith had, was connected totally to your healing and prosperity. Totally. And I started believing that. Ash and I were dating, and I have, I have literally told her, the reason why you're still sick is because you don't have enough faith. <laughs> that was a good day. Woo! <laughs> Woo! How many times did we break up, by the way? Oh my gosh, whoo, oh man, I could tell stories about that. Anyways, so I went hyper, I went, I mean, I told her, the Lord told us we're going to get married, she was like, you can take that, and anyways, but, uh, oh, this is not a marriage conference, anyways, uh, or a dating thing, um, so my faith was, was connected to this idea of everything that's happening around me is directly connected to my love and connection with God. So I'm sitting with this guy, and he is in a really bad condition, really bad condition. He's uh, waiting uh, for, um, you know, a procedure to happen. He is not in good shape. And so I just went to visit him, and uh, he is still, be he's still believing this thought, and he feels, I, I could just see it in his eyes, that he deeply believes, and I'm not quite sure this, but so I'm just going to say what I felt, like, he, like, I could see it in his eyes that he's like, I think God's forgotten me because I'm in so much pain. And I'm like, bro, you're just older and it's not connected to that. Like it's not connected because you go through pain, because you're sick and because you can't pray it away doesn't mean that God is not for you. And that doesn't mean miracles don't happen. And your like sometimes our theology is so messed up. It's so messed up, and that's why we give reasons for people going through, uh, th why they go through their pain, and it's just wrong. We should never do that. Things, sometimes things just don't work out, and people are live through it through this life. They have to go through it, but God gives them a different kinds of, kind of strength. But when we, we, when we have this bad idea or theology, man, we can screw up our faith because we're like, oh, I'm praying and this happened. I'm praying and that happened. And then I'm praying and nothing happened. And then I'm praying and oh my gosh, my life's a mess. And then what you go is, you go, well, I don't believe in God anymore because that doesn't work. No, your theology didn't work. Like you, that was just messed up. God's the same. You, you just had a warped view of thinking. And that's why I love that we're here at Mosaic and we exist to reclaim Reclaim something. 
We reclaim the message and the movement of Jesus. And the message of Jesus is, hey, it's not all flowers and daisies and everything's going to work. And if you just fast and pray and, and pour oil all over yourself and your house and your dog, <laughs> it's all going to work out. Because you know what? John, John's sitting there going, hey, bro, where you at? Where you at? I mean, I'm just sitting here, I'm thinking, you know, if he was my boy, uh, if he was really the Messiah, I would not be beheaded. Like, I'm not, like, that's not, that's, I'm not going to lose my head over this. Right? When God has the power to heal you and set you free and he doesn't do it, what do you do? What do you do? Do you walk away or do you stand in your pain with him? I love these, this passage uh, in Hebrew. Um, Hebrew 11 is like, it just runs down like all the people who did great things by faith, okay? So it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the chapter of faith. It describes where it is, gives you examples. But at the end of it, he kind of turns the corner and he starts off and he says this in verse 32. We'll pick it up there. He says, what more shall I say? Like he's listed all these things. He says, I, I, I do not have time. He says, I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and, Bar- and, Bar- and, uh, and uh, Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered. They conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into what? Strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed out foreign enemies. And women received back their dead, raised to life again. Wow, he says, I can't tell you all these people by faith experience all these things. And then he says, and then, and then, let me read the next. He says, and then there were the, what? The others, the others, which we don't talk about a whole lot. But he's like, let me just talk to you about the others. Because I listed all the people who did amazing things through faith. But let me tell you about the others who stood in their pain. Let me tell you, the others were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an ever better resurrection. Some faced jeers and, were f- and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were s- what? They were what? Oh my gosh. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and and goatskins, dissolute, persecuted, and what? Mistreated. And this is the best line ever, ever. Verse 38, verse 38. And what? The world was not worthy of them. Now, all those people did amazing things. But the ones who stood in their pain, those, those, let me just stop right here, those, oh my goodness, the world was not even worthy of them. I mean, they were, they were just, they were just, they were a different breed of people who stood there. Like I'm, I'm, like, I'm talking about the guy, like John, I'm talking about that him. I'm talking about who who in the midst of their pain did not lose faith and went to his death believing. Those guys, the ones who stand in the loss and despair and the grief and the anxiety when you can't get out of bed and when the the biggest win, you know, is for you to actually is actually for you to go to work. I mean, the ones who go and push through. I mean, the ones who who have prayed and prayed and prayed and believed and believed and believed and, 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 and have all the faith in the world, have all the faith in the world, yet find themselves stuck, find themselves dissolute, find themselves being bullied around, find themselves being tossed, find themselves uh, in, in debt, find themselves just having going through all kinds of hard things. Let me just tell you, those people, those people, the world is what? It's not worthy of them. You could, all the, the world can have all these other people, but these people, 
They're just, they're, they're the special kind of people. And he keeps, he keeps on going. He says, they wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. And then he says, oh, these were all commended for their what? Faith. And then he says this, and yet none of them received what had been promised since God had prepared something better for us so that only together with us would we be made perfect. He's saying, hey, there is a, there is a bigger future reality that if you and I would just, just stick it through, just stand in your pain, and I wish I had more time to just talk through, like, what does that look like? I think for some of us, it's, 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 it's basically um, three things. It's, it's one is, is remembering, remembering um, g- not, just, not just God's word, but God's ways, like how he has worked or how he does work, just remembering that. Um, the other, for the next one, for, I would say is for uh, some of us, it's this idea of like fully engaging, like not just remember, but fully engage, engage in what's going on in your life. I think pain makes us just sit down. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, when things don't work out for me, I just want to just, just put on Netflix. Anybody? And sometimes I watch the same shows again and again. Anybody do that? Anybody do that? Because I don't have the emotional capacity to get involved in another show. <laughs> like, I don't want to know. Let's play The Office one more time. <laughs> like, I'm just, and Ashley walks in, she's like, are you serious? I'm like, you know what? Don't judge me. You do you, boo. You know, like, I'm going to do this because I, I just need this, okay? I just need this and some dark chocolate. I mean, I, mean, I just need, there's a few things I need. Anyways, but anyways. So there, there are times in your life you're like, I don't want to engage. And so, so if you're in the midst of this, I think you have to remember, but you have to engage. And what does that mean? Here's the question for you. This, is, this, is, this, will, this will help you out. If you don't know what to do next, what is the next right thing for you to do? Not the plan. I don't know. I don't even know the plan. You don't even know the plan. What is the next right decision you can make? Based on what you're going through, what is the next right thing you can do? N- n- not tomorrow, like today. What is the next right thing? If you begin to think that way, you fully engage in the present. So remember, engage, and lastly, uh, believe. Believe. And that is, I know that's a word that go, you go, I, I don't even know how to believe. I don't even know how to believe. Um, so last week I was at, um, at Metro, right? And there's an there's a amazing couple at Metro, uh, Pat and Scott. If you guys are there, make some noise. If you know them, make some noise for them. They're, they're, uh, I think they're saying they're the oldest couple at Metro, right? Uh, okay. But um, so I was talking to uh, Scott uh, last week, and he said, uh, he said, hey, I got some prayer beads. And he said, it's, it's really changing my, uh, my spirituality. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this idea of prayer beads, how uh, different cultures have them, and, uh, and uh, I brought my, my dad's prayer beads out. And this idea of like taking the prayer beads, the rosary beads, I think some Catholics or most Catholics use, um, there, this idea of like you take, you have a rosary bead and you begin to meditate and think about and repeat either a promise, um, and it is a great action step. It's a great way to practically, practically tell your soul what you believe. And so he, as he was talking, he was like, man, I, he said, I, 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 I thank you for giving me the freedom to do that. Because sometimes when you come into, you know, modern Christianity, you're like, oh, all the old things are like, uh, taboo or not, not whatever. And as I talked about prayer beads, I'm like, it's a great practice to just believe in God's promise and believe and you remind yourself because here's what worry and believe is. You, worry is dwelling on something again and again and again and believing is dwelling on something again and again and again and again and again. And so what do you need to do today? How do you need to stand in your pain? Do you need to remember? You just need to remember, hey, God did show up for you all those years. He'll do it again. Do you need to, um, man, do you need to fully engage? Are you like, I'm done, I'm done. You know, I haven't been, I haven't been 
engaged in my family. I just, you know, things are not working out, and I get that. But what does it look like for you to engage again? What's the next right thing? And guys, and then what do you need to do to believe? What do you need to, uh, what do you need to do? Do you need to move away from this idea like, oh, because bad things are happening to me, I must not, I must be bad. Because he's not saving me, because he's not getting me out of prison, because he's not setting me free, because, 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 because he's not here, he doesn't love me anymore. And from some of you, this is the hardest thing you're going to do. But you have to break out of this. You have to not walk away from your pain. You have to stand in it. And if you stand in it well, it will cause you to show an example or cause you to be an example to even your kids, your family, your friends around you. And how, let me ask you this, and how can you stand? Like, do you need help? Do you, do you need, what do you need to do? What does that look like for you to do that? Man, we need to do that, don't we? We just really do. So let's do this. Let me, um, why don't you stand together? I want to pray for you. Let's stand together. Hmm. Lord God, I thank you so much for this conversation. God, I know that uh, as we are in this moment, you're, you're, you're here at at the Hope Center and you're at Metro. But most importantly, you're in our lives. You've never left. And so God, in Jesus' name I pray, would you give us, would you give us the power to to fully believe that in spite of all the things that we're going through, you are still committed to us. Would you cause us to remember your word, the promises you've given us, and also your ways. Would you help us engage and do the next right thing in Jesus' name? In Jesus' name, would you?